How much do you know about a reentry of prisoners into society? I have no, I have no idea. I didn't know nothing about prisoners. The word recidivism, meaning to fall back, is the act of relapsing into a previous negative behavior. In today's society, recidivism is most often used when referring to individuals who return to prison after being released from their sentence. Approximately 60% of ex-offenders re-enter the system within three years of their release. This leads us to the obvious question, why is the recidivism rate so high? What is different about these men and women that keeps them cycling through prison? In order to understand why people return to prison, we must first understand what caused people to enter prison, what happens to them when they are there, and then how the world reacts towards them when they return. Philadelphia. Uh, back then, there was a lot of uh, racism, and it was it was pretty rough. There was a lot of gangs back then, and everything was very territorial. Uh, sometimes we used to just fight our way off as kids. I mean, I was like uh, eight, nine years old. I remember even having to defend my mother, you know, and that is because my father left us at an early age. Uh, he barely supported us. It was much abuse at home. My mother kicked him out the age when I was eight. That's when I started hanging with these crowds. There were drafts. Guys come up to you, where you from? I'm from nowhere. Bing, bing, bing. Where you from? I'm from nowhere. Bing, bing, bing. You're from Zulu now. Okay, I'm from Zulu. Whoever said you was from Zulu, they play this psychological game and beat you down and then they make you fight all these guys and then they draft you. And they tell you, this is the time you're supposed to come around the neighborhood and, and, and uh, take up your post. Um, depending on your status, a heart was somebody who had uh, a lot of clout, somebody who's known to really, uh, he was a good fighter, so they would call him a heart. Then you had your warlords who would keep all the weapons, know where all the weapons were stashed and stuff like that. And we used to have spring training, just like baseball. You know, you go to the playgrounds, you box, you box each other. You get beat down the next day, you know, they keep you nice and sharp with your hands and all until you get it right. I remember, um, got a got good gash to this day I got right here from from a knife that I blocked and all. And uh, I always remember that one and this one right here and another one further up my arm. I lost a lot of friends in gang wars. At this time I was like 14 years old and I was sitting on, in a small street near uh, Germantown Avenue. We were drinking wine and singing doo-wop songs like we used to and just having a great time, you know, me and my clique and, and some of the older guys. And um, Wall Street came up in two cars, pulled up on two cars, and they just opened their windows and just cut loose with sawed-off shotguns and everything, and I just ducked. And as I ducked, I remember being splattered by the gooey stuff, and it was red and all, and I, and, and I turned around and he blew one of my friend's heads off. As I fell, I seen another one over next to me, one of our uh, leaders, uh, and his arm from the shotgun pellets was like missing. It was gone. I could see almost to like the bone and everything. And I seen all this blood and I was like, God, please don't get out the car. Please don't get out the car. Please let me live. I, I remember I was on the ground praying to God, praying to God uh, in silence. Uh, please give me this chance uh, to live. In 1995, after I had my back operation, I really got into heavy opiates, morphine and all that. It just took totally control of my, of my life. My brother has struggled for, uh, with a drug addiction for about 12 years now, and it, it, that, that is the hardest part, coming home and seeing the drug in him, not seeing my brother, looking at him and seeing what he has done. He, it changes his whole persona. Um, my brother would, my brother's one of the most kind-hearted people, smart, he's intelligent, and to see him stealing and taking money from, from me and my mom and, and my, fa my family. I lost two brothers, and the last one, I was combing his hair, 
and I was holding him up. And I think he probably weighed 85 pounds soaking wet. And I was combing his hair. I said, you're going to be all right. You're going you're gonna to beat this thing, man. You just, you know, you, you need to stop worrying. That variation is killing you. And when I went to place him back, it's like rigorous mortis kicked in just that fast. They say he usually kicks in later, but no, he was stiff. I had to pry his hands, his fingers from me and lay him down. It was uh, devastating. To this day, I, uh, I really miss all my brothers. And so I, um, when the nurse came to collect his morphine, in which by that time they had it in IV packs, I lied to her. Out of the box, I, I stashed six of them, and she came over, says, walk me to the bathroom, and she had a surgical knife. She says, here, help me. And she gave me a surgical knife. I says, and help you what? She says, uh, cut these bags and pour them in the toilet. I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, you can use this for another patient. He says, no. This is our protocol. This is what we're supposed to do. So I, I didn't want to give her any indication that I, I was using it because the second I would say, hey, I, let us keep it or something like that, she would have knew I stashed more. So I sat there and cut them up, cut them up. And me and my cousin and my uh, other brother were making cocktails out of it with cranberry juice and drinking the morphine. We took it out of there, uh, out of the plastic IV packs and put them in bottles. Then when the morphine was gone, I was crying hysterically. I missed them. I started uh, messing around with her and, and uh, uh, I met my match. You know, I, w I would experience a lot of anger at first and um, we would even fight at times and I would, it would be like screaming matches in my house and I would see my mom on her, on her knees pleading with my brother to please stop. And now that he is, um, he just got sentenced to 18 months in prison and I think the, the first time that I finally let go of the anger is when I walked into the prison and it was actually on my birthday that I sat there with a cold glass between us and my brother looked in my eyes and he said, how could you still love me after everything I've done to you? And I've realized that an addiction is a disease and it, it's not, um, the, the drug is the solution. I lost a job, I couldn't keep a job, couldn't stay focused on anything but my next fix and dealing and that lasted off and on until I went to prison in Florida in 98. I would describe drinking as a beast, literally, like, like a beast. For me, I knew that if I continued to drink, I would be dead. I was either gonna die of cirrhosis of the liver, I was gonna die in a DUI-related car accident, or I was gonna die by suicide. Because for me personally, and for the alcoholic in general, drinking consumes you from the inside out. I lived in Philadelphia all my life. Growing up, Mother, father, both in my life, um, say it happened in October 2011. It started off as a fight between females. I got out of my car. I approached the situation. Shots rang out. I parked my car at 9th and Pike. I was arrested with a handgun on Franklin and Butler. From there, my life has been more difficult than I ever imagined it. And hearing a judge sentence, it kind of threw me in a loop. I, I, didn't, I didn't fully grasp it until they took me back into the holding area. That I wasn't going to see my family. I, I, it was a chance that I could miss the birth of my son. And me not being able to see my daughter at her ballet recitals and things like it. It, it broke me down. It was very heartbreaking for my family. I think for my mom, she took it the hardest. Um, he also has a three-year-old daughter, and um, that was very, um, it was very hard to explain to a three-year-old why um, her daddy couldn't be around anymore. It was a burden of who's going to provide for his children now. Being processed to go to jail, you're going to prison now. Of course, growing up, you know, they never, of course, a mother's intention is never for her son to end up in prison. So I think it was more of um, a fear that I had gotten myself onto a road where I would not be able to get off of, where I had gotten myself into a situation where over the course of many years, it would end up being incredibly uh, non-beneficial to me in my future. You know, I think my mom's major concern and my family's major concern at that point was would I ever be uh, acceptable in society again or would I be, you know, working dead-end jobs because nobody would hire me. For some inmates, 
this is the most horrible, awful, and terrible thing that's ever happened to them. For some inmates, it's status quo. It's called, and I hate to sound overly technical, it's a, a uh, maturational crisis versus a situational crisis. A uh, situational crisis is when a person, uh, their life is going along, along pretty well and some kind of traumatic event happens that lands them in prison. And those are the ones that react negatively to the prison environment. Then it's the, there's another kind of inmate who has a maturational crisis crisis in his life, and that is he's matured into the prison system. He's been coming and getting in trouble since he was a kid. To be quite honest with you, I was terrified. At that point, I was probably 125 pounds, 5 foot 8, and all you, all you see and you, and you hear growing up is prison is so terrible. You know, you hear all the horror stories about people getting beat up and people getting used and abused. So the very first time I ever went, I was absolutely petrified. I remember walking in there not knowing what to expect. Um, I wasn't sure who my celly was going to be. That's the, the guy who I was going to be bunking with. I wasn't sure um, if I was going to be, you know, assaulted in, in various ways. It was just, it was terrifying. I just, I didn't know what to expect. I think the unknown is the worst. Well, when you first go in, they put you in this thing called a tank. And this is where everyone who's coming into the prison, you go into this one big room and you're waiting to be processed. You're waiting for them to, you know, take your, your sneakers or your boots, depending on what brand it was. Um, they take your shoestrings out. Yeah, turn your phone in, turn your money in, jewelry, everything. After that, the next room, you had to go and see, you had to take your stuff off, whatever, and you go sit on this booth. And that determines if you have any kind of metal objects in you. After that, you went to the next room, which was the cavity search. Now you get a shower, they give you your orange jumpsuit, and you get, a, you get your blankets, you get your sheets, you get your, your toothpaste, your soap, and all that. Because they, they start you out with it. And then after that, once it's gone, I hope you got some money on your books. Now you go to a certain block if, depending on what your charge is or what your custody level is. You, you don't feel like a man no more because you're not moving at your own pace, at your own will. You're at the mercy of everyone that have a badge on. We have three basic goals. Uh, uh, stabilization goals. When they first come in the door, they don't get any worse than they did when they first got here. The second one is reconstructive goals. Reconstructive goals are finding their strengths and, and enhancing them, finding their weaknesses and shoring the weaknesses up. But the third one, the, the one that you're talking about, is situational goals. Making the goals uh, specific to the situation of the inmate. They may have issues with their family, they may have problems with, uh, uh, with the jobs, they may have problems with housing. We create um, a mental internal strength so they'll be able to um, deal with the situation that's particular to them. To be treated like a number, not a human being, is very different. It's, 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 it's a hurt feeling. When you're looking at three men to a cell and two in a bunk and, and one on a boat, we call it the boat, but it's actually like a, a, a hard plastic canoe, somebody sleeping on the floor. My first cell mate, the guy was, mentally you could tell he was unstable. He would get up in the middle of the night and it felt like you, he's watching you. And that would be the case. Fights happen all day, every day. And it's so easy to get stabbed, man. So you gotta worry about fights turning into a possible homicide. By that time, certain body language, certain things you had, certain it just comes natural, you know what to expect, when to move, who to, you know, who to, who to align yourself with, who not to align yourself with. You, you get good at watching people's actions and, and it tends to make you aware of what's, the, what's to come next. 2011, October 2nd, is, uh, was my last bit. Oh man, it felt like the 4th of July, Christmas and my birthday at the same time in one shot, because you, you see the same colors, gray and brown and beige for all these years, and you see the same colors, and then you come out and you see the color, the, the rooftop of McDonald's, and there's a big thing, it's red. It's, it's like you're a little, like a little boy, and everything that's colorful, it just excites you. And, oh, God, just, 
It's just the greatest feeling in the world. I mean, the, the, the one advantage of being in prison, in a prison, if there, if there is an advantage of being in prison, is that it's a highly structured program. Someone is telling you when to get up, when to go to bed, what to, what to wear. We have balanced meals. Um, we help them as far as vocational education. And when you get out, when you, when you are released, those things go away. You're kind of on your own. When my day came down for me to be, to re be released, I tried to be humble. Because, you know, some people tend to not like that you're being released. Might want to fight you, get you more time. Once that guard come down to walk you out that gate, your heart get racing, it's, it's beating out of control because you're so overwhelmed with the fact that you're outside to see cars, to, to see pe other people without a corrections uniform on. So excited just to go home and sleep in my own bed with whatever. It wasn't a bunk, it wasn't a hard mat. It felt good. There are many programs in existence that help inmates transition back into society both during and after incarceration. Local programs such as RISE in Philadelphia and national programs such as Teen Challenge give prisoners a second chance by assisting them with accountability, education, and a new mindset when reintegrating. However, none of the programs are successful unless the associate entering the program is ready to commit their life to change. There's no programs that's going to save your life. That's what a lot of people think, that they're going to come home and because they've been incarcerated for so long, they've been taken care of. You should more depend on yourself because it's about you. If you want to be successful, you don't want to return back to the people, places, things that got you there in the first place. You have to try to take the foot, the step forward yourself. They say a thousand miles start with a single step, and I believe your steps should start before you reintegrate into the community. Reentry starts with oneself when they're incarcerated. It's a mental thing. See, a person can come to jail, and they can come to jail without a GED, but then they can obtain that GED. Then they can take up a few trades like plumbing, electricity, carpentry work, landscaping, barber. But then when they come home and they break the law and come back to jail, society says, well, how did he or she come back to jail when they was rehabilitated, when they was in jail? No, they wasn't rehabilitated because rehabilitation starts with the mind, the way you see things, the way you perceive things, how you think. That's how it is. When you change the way you think, then you change life forever. When I was delivered from alcohol, it wasn't so much that I was delivered from the drinking more than I was delivered from the, from the things that led me to drink, the negative feelings, you know, that are associated with it. It was like, it's like a cycle of self-defeat. You wake up every morning with negative feelings and those negative feelings lead to negative actions. And those negative actions lead to negative consequences and those negative consequences lead to negative feelings, which lead to negative actions, which lead to negative consequences. So Teen Challenge focuses on the negative feelings and they isolate those and they work on those, you know, and that once I was able to deal with those, I no longer needed the drinking. My responsibilities are twofold. First, to ensure that the facilities we have, the jails that we have, operate in a safe and orderly manner. And that on the other side, to uh, make sure that uh, the inmates and, and offenders who uh, are committed to us have the opportunity to emerge better than when they were committed. Immediately upon entry, I felt something that was very powerful for me and it took me weeks if not months of discussing it with both Jim and my wife Noel. I saw the tremendous potential among these men. We have uh, a pre-literacy program, a GED preparation program, a GED testing program and, and a college program for uh, beginning college students. If you've been in a maximum security prison for a long period of time and you have managed to um, find enough self-reflection, uh, self-control to be at the point where you can take college-level courses, you face some very profound things in yourself. One of our greater for gentlemen, uh, who at 19 was getting in trouble regularly, was involved with a group of guys that got into trouble, and his friend stabbed somebody with a knife and that person died. This, this man goes in there, he has a subpar education, he's been told uh, most of his life that he's no good, that he's, he's an idiot, he's too stupid to get a decent education, comes in, finds his way through a GED program, and then spends 15 years 
trying to accumulate enough credits to graduate from Villanova. It gives them a sense of accomplishment because they, for many of them, they've never completed programming or education at any time in their life. It gives them a, uh, you know, a, a goal to continue their education. It provides them with uh, uh, proof to their families and friends that they've turned their lives around and they've been able to they've been able to engineer a change and it's also given them confidence that they you know they're they're capable of achievement he's going to be presenting his diploma to his mother this december as a way to say mom see i can do great things so the classroom in which i teach is fairly uh, uh, drab and the furniture is, is is falling apart on the other hand the enthusiasm of the men make the class really quite extraordinary uh, it's a strange place. Uh, it seems almost outside of time. And I think there's a widespread societal fear of the so-called criminal. And, and you think of the media images of what it means to have a criminal mentality, or even the very idea that there is such a thing, makes it very difficult for these guys coming on the outside. They, they really have a, a stigma to overcome. Besides the employers of companies that are already familiar with the uh, people reintegrating from an institution that's, that's on a positive level, there's not much employment you could receive from certain, even with federal grants and certain programs that have been installed regarding the federal government, it don't seem to be an uproar or upscale of anybody being hired that's been reintegrated unless you know someone or have an inside hand. The biggest thing about being in prison, of course, is once you're released, you're in the system. So it's very hard for people to, to, to get back to a normal life because they, it's hard for them to get jobs. You know, what do they do when they're on probation? They've got these fines to pay. They've got prison things they need to pay. They've got probation they need to do. But then they're expected to get a job on top of that. I do think there's both sides to it. And, and actually, I, I think one of the things I find remarkable about the, the men there, the guys are really good at holding two thoughts together. One is they're responsible for the shape of their lives. And their sense of responsibility is, is both um, negative in the sense of regretting having done some things that uh, uh, really upended their lives and the lives of the uh, people that they cared about, and also positive in the sense of uh, their sense of being able still to make a contribution. Many, some of the lifers that I've gotten to know spend a great deal of their time and effort mentoring other men. Uh, trying to encourage them to get educated, trying to encourage them to take their, their lives seriously, to, to learn new skills, and also to um, be communally minded, not simply think of themselves, themselves. Most of the men exit a place like Greaterford with very little money in hand, with a set, typically a set of subpar skills. They go back into the communities that they were embedded originally, and the majority of them return. Judging from the figures that are our in-house data that we collect, we, we see as many as 58 percent uh, of inmates who are released in three years that return to our custody. From our analysis, it looks like uh, participation in programs helps reduce that figure by half. The future is going to hold anything. What we ought to be able to do is to identify those men and women who really have the capability of becoming educated, not just allowing a trickle to come through, but opening up the floodgates to allow every individual who has that capability to enter into a degree granting program. And then once they get close to graduation, we should spend some time trying to help them figure out what those next steps are and have the kind of institutional support and financial support that allows them to reintegrate. Without doing that, what we're going to get is this continuing revolving door. We are not able to contribute to the bills because we just came home. So in fact, we take and dive into the struggles that our family already has. We become part of their bills. So if my sister is struggling with her bills and then she says to the parole board that I can come there, now I'm coming home with no money. I'm not able to contribute right away to the bills, the groceries and stuff like that. But as a man, that's not a good feeling. That's not a great feeling at all. But that's when the struggle comes. Because now you have to say to yourself, do I resort back to what I do best, which got me locked up in the first place, so obviously I don't do that great. But in our mind, we think that's what we do best because that's all we know to do. Hustling, rob, steal, and kill, whatever got you in jail. Now I understand some people believe that what we're doing then is rewarding people for going to prison, but it's the opposite. 
what they have to go through to get things that most of us ordinarily take for granted is, is an unbelievable task. I used to think money was wealth. It's not. Wealth is something that you can obtain that don't cost anything, like a good wife, beautiful children, a relationship with your guy. That's wealth. A lot of people, you ask them their self-worth, they automatically think of a dollar sign. Right now, in our community, we should have scholars walking around, future scholars. We don't have that. What we have in our community now is future inmates. It took a, a long time to adjust because you get back into reality, you're back where it's rules and regulations and, and you have to abide by them. You have to provide for yourself, your family, whatever, so you come back to a world where you have to adjust. When I first tried to obtain employment, I went into a shopping center and the manager was so willing to help me and help me all the way through the process, except that when it got to my criminal history, it was a situation where I found that they were helping me. And then when it came time for my criminal background check and I felt out and I said, yes, I was a convicted felon, it didn't matter what I was convicted of, the institution didn't want to help me. But also the perpetrator's family, no one will reach out to them. And even for my family, for, for me, um, just people looking down on them and, and, and making my brother seem like he is this monster. And he's not a monster, he has a heart, he just has a problem that he needs to help and, and needs fixing. When they see young black male with uh, possession of a firearm charge, this is like, oh, he's dangerous. My record doesn't defy who I am. I would love for the fact that somebody that wouldn't judge me on it and to give me the opportunity to prove myself. I'm in school right now. I'm ready to go to college afterwards. Felt good about myself, and um, I'm a change. I can honestly say I'm a changed man today. When one of these men get out, they have had to go beyond the call of duty in order to prove themselves worthy again. So much more than any of the rest of us have ever had to do. I, I think. Uh, I think Christ's forgiveness of all of us, his understanding that we are all sinners, is important here as well, and to give them a second chance. Honestly, like the, the ex-convicts I've worked with, like they were like a lot scared. Like they were they were not scared, they were more they were a lot more aware of like what they were trying to do. Like if something like if something bad would have happened, like, you know, at work, they're you know, like, let's chill, let's sit back, you know, because we don't want to end up back in jail, so. They are ready to prove themselves in society. In fact, they have more to prove than the rest of us because they want to go in and they want to demonstrate to society that they can do something good as well as the evil that they've done. But here's what society don't understand. If you and I went on a boat trip and the wealthy can go up top if you can afford it, and those that can't afford it has to be on the bottom. Y'all up there with water. We on the bottom ask y'all for some water and y'all won't even send us water down. Y'all neglect us in order for us to get some water. We poke a hole in the bottom of the boat. Now the water comes through. Not only do we suffer, but you drown as well. It's the same thing with society when they throw individuals in jail and walk away. To say that these men and women who have been incarcerated are no longer fit to be a part of their workforce doesn't allow them to be fully a part of society. Success is a collaborative effort. Uh, one person can't do it, one unit can't do it, but it takes working together. Not doing anything doesn't affect change. I really feel very strongly that we need to move away from this idea that we're punishing dangerous people towards the notion is that we're trying to recover our connection to alienated brothers and sisters. And I think until we do that, uh, our criminal justice system is really going to be better at inculcating suffering than it will be in promoting justice. Some of us still have families and friends and loved ones. We still have hearts. We're still human beings. We still deserve to be given another chance. And a lot of us are successful once provided with the opportunity to take another chance. I just hope people accept me for the person I portray and not the person that I was. I remember this quotation that kept me uh, going. Everything can be taken from a man except for one thing, the last of human freedoms. Choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. For these individuals, the return into society is only the beginning. It is the start of a long and difficult journey to rebuild their lives. Every day, these individuals face the decision to return to their previous life or to rise above it.